So with this lecture, we're getting back to the area of public key cryptography. So we have now seen the whole range of what is happening when you connect to the internet. We have seen elliptic curves for doing the different Hellman key exchange, and we've seen elliptic curves for doing signatures. And then we've seen symmetric encryption, and we've seen max for integrity and authenticity protection. Now we're getting back to the RSA crypto system, which is another public key system, both for encryption and for signatures. And so this is the moment to reflect on what are actually the formal notions that a public key crypto system has to satisfy. So for signatures, I've shown you this already for public key encryption. Well, we have seen it if Hellman, which is not an encryption scheme. It's not a scheme which takes a message and gives you a ciphertext for it. We have only seen this for the perfect code system. So let me run through what you're expected to provide when you're designing a public key crypto system. So first of all, you have to design a key generation system. A key generation system, you ask, hey, give me a, a private key, secret, a public key pair for a certain security size, and then it generates this. An encryption system takes a public key and a message and produces ciphertext. And similarly, a decryption operation takes the ciphertext, and now it's a public key system, so we're taking the private key for the decryption and get the message back. Now, this context, the message is also called the plain text. For signature, we also have key generation and then signing and verification. And normally, public key encryption and public key signatures, well, you might share some mathematical ideas behind those, but typically those have very different shapes. RSA, and we'll get to that um, today and tomorrow, or in the next lecture, um, RSA is exceptional in those in that, that those two are very analogous, but normally they're not. And do remember that while both signatures and MAC achieve authenticity and integrity, but they have a different data flow. So when you have a signature, then anybody can verify it because it's a verification using the public key. Whereas for MAC, it's a verification using a secret key. So it's something where both parties need to have the same secret key only then you can verify the integrity protection. So signatures belong to the field of public key cryptography and max to symmetric key cryptography. All right, so then the formal security notions for encryption. So what does the attacker want to achieve and what are the attacker's abilities? So the attacker's goals are to recover the secret key from the public key. That's, well, a very strong goal. But we've always seen in the perfect key code crypto system that, well, you actually have a pretty nice break if you can recover a message from a ciphertext. You will not necessarily get the secret key for this, but you're totally breaking the security of the system. And so this has a name called one-wayness. So OW is the one-wayness property. And then, well, this is a bit vaguely formulated, saying learn anything about plain text. So you're given the ciphertext and you should not be able to learn anything about the plain text. And that is called semantic security. Now if I ask you, hey, analyze the system for semantic security, you'll probably be a little bit hard pressed. And that's not just because you're still learning. Well, everybody is still learning, but because you're early in your career, it's actually something that we generally find hard to argue about. But nicely enough, we have an equivalent security notion, which is called indistinguishability. And indistinguishability is the following, well, we describe this as a game. So the attacker chooses two messages, M0 and M1, and they put in everything they can. So these are really attacker shows messages. Then the attacker gives them to a challenger and receives back the encryption under the public key of one of those messages. Well, it's guaranteed to be one of those two, but the attacker doesn't know which one of those. And so 50-50 chance of guessing. Um, so the, encrypt the advantage against the indistinguishability game is the extra beyond 50% that it's getting better. Okay, so the attacker goals are key recovery, breaking the one-wayness, or breaking indistinguishability. And then on the other side, what are the abilities? So in a public key system, the attacker can always use the public key to encrypt plain text of his choice. 
And since the tech can encrypt plain text of their choice, well, they can also decrypt those. There's nothing exciting there. In the e, so that's the chosen plain text attack, CPA. In the chosen cyber text attack, there they have more power. They can take any cipher text and ask for the decryption of the cipher text. Now, this is called CCA security, so chosen cipher text security. And there are two versions of this game. One in which they can only do this, well, asking for decryption before they have to choose the messages, say in the in the indistinguishability game, and one where they also can do, well, do further uh, decryption oracles after they receive the challenge ciphertext. So we're going to see indistinguishable, so in CCA2, an attack on the RSA crypto system. All right, so speaking of which, here we come, the RSA encryption system. And in big bold face red, this is the schoolbook system. At the very last slide, we'll get to a proper RSA encryption system. So please do not use schoolbook RSA in practice. It explains all the math features. If you can break the math in this one, you can break the real RSA. But there are a lot of other ways how to break this. Um, I've recorded a bunch of videos for a bachelor course. Um, ranting about how bad schoolbook RSA is and if you don't believe this right away I invite you to watch schoolbook RSA is bad 1 till 5. Okay so key generation what do we do we're picking two primes p and q and those two primes must be different although also these have to be fairly large and well if you're picking random large primes they're sure to be different. The next step is pretty easy we're computing n as a product of those and then we're computing the order 5 function, which is p minus 1 times q minus 1. Then we pick an exponent e, where the only requirement is that it's co prime to this phi of n. So one thing is that the primes are odd, so p minus 1 and q minus 1 are even, so well, e has to be odd. But, well, Good chance it can be 3, but you typically want something slightly larger. What is a typical number is 2 to the 16 plus 1. That is a very sparse exponent, and we're going to see in a moment why this matters. The next part is computing the inverse of e modulo phi of n and calling that d. Now, if you're using Sage or something like this, it's an easy step. If you would be doing this by hand, um, well, it's a polynomial time algorithm. You have seen the extended Euclidean algorithm for generally how to invert numbers or numbers more to something else. So it's doable, but this is a more computation intensive step. And then you're done. I mean, the biggest step is really step one. Picking primes, you'll be waiting for a while. If you ever generated um, your PGP key on your laptop and your laptop doesn't have a hard drive but an SSD, it will be sitting there for a while and asking you like, hey, can you do some more gymnastics because, well, I need more randomness. And that's because to find a prime, it has to do lots of random choices. We're going to see how to figure out whether a number is prime. Okay, so after this, the public key is n, e and the private key is n, d. So this d is a secret exponent. The n is shared between the public and the private key. Uh, notation issue, this is the proper way of doing it because you should only need the private key for the decryption. Okay, then encryption, simply you're taking the message to the E, computing mod the N, that gives you the ciphertext. And that's actually the reason why we want that E is a sparse number. It's something where, well, you have seen square and multiply, uh, you have seen double and add method for exponentiation using the square and multiply method, which is basically the same just well written with the exponent. Also for this one I have an older video sitting around with slides that you can watch. And so the cyber text is simply m to the e mod n. And then the plain text to get back the message to the was we're taking the cipher text to the power d this private exponent again mod n. Now what does it work? Alright, lots of things here. So the relationship between d and e is that d times e, well, if I move the e inverse over to the d side, I have d times e is congruent to 1 modulo phi of n. And I can also write this modulo phi of n 
as well there exists some k such that there's a multiple that this is a multiple of phi of n. So this one up here implies that e times d is equal to 1 plus k sums phi of n for some k. And we're going to use this k in a moment. Then we want to prove that n prime is actually the message that got put in for the encryption. Of course, well, for the decryption, we'd like to get the message back. Okay, so the encryption has produced a C, and now the decryption takes a C to the D. And so I'll plug in what C is, expand, and expand again using this equation. Okay, so now we have M to the 1. That's actually what we want to have. And then there's also, well, this other part. And so we now want to focus on this other part and show that it's 1. And so this other part is m to the k times phi of n, where I'll change the order a little bit, put the k outside, keep the phi of n inside. And then you should have seen Fermat's little theorem that says that, or Euler's theorem, that says that m to the phi of n is common to 1 mod n. So since m and n sound very different, they sound very similar, the exponent phi of n the same as the n in the modulus and well whatever basis to the phi of n is common to one modulo n okay so and then one to the k remains one so yes indeed m prime is equal to m so this crypto system actually works now when we look at the security analysis we have just seen the attacker goals so i'm just copying them here and also copying the attacker abilities. So this first thing is an attack on the indistinguishability under the ability of well encrypting, which is not a very powerful attack, not a very uh, strong power in a public key system because any attacker can do that. Okay, so in the game, the attacker chooses two messages, gives them to a challenger, the challenger returns a ciphertext. Now this ciphertext is either the encryption of M0 or the encryption of M1. Okay, let's go back for a moment. The encryption of the message is taking the message to the E and computes the ciphertext. Well, our attacker can do that. RSA, the schoolbook version of RSA, is deterministic. So the attacker can just compute, well, the two possible ciphertexts, figure out which one of them matches C, and is done. Now, from the hardness of the security notions, if you don't achieve in CPA, you also don't achieve in CCA. So, schoolbook RSA is not in CA, in CCA one or two secure. Because it's not even in distinguished in CPA secure. So, how about the one wayness? One wayness is really the thing. I mean, you want to hide the message. But let's look at what abilities we have, and also let's look at what RSA offers us. First, a neutral observation. So RSA encryption is what we call homomorphic. So this is the same homomorphic that you must have, might have seen as a math term, namely, if you have a homomorphic function from one group to another, then you can have the function applied to two group elements. The first group with the plus in between them is the same as the function applied to the first one, and the other one combined with the group operation, the second one. So here, well, it's on the message spaces and the ciphertext spaces. Let's assume we have some operation on the ciphertext space, call it circ, and an operation triangle on the message spaces. And then a homomorphic encryption is such that when you do one operation on the ciphertext space, so you're getting the encryption of M1 combined with the encryption of M2, that actually is encryption of some operation on the ciphertexts. Well, this might be a desirable feature, but it might also be a total mess. So let's first see that RSA is homomorphic. So for RSA, we can multiply our ciphertexts. So we're multiplying M1 to the E times M2 to the E. Well, both of them have exponent E, so we can put this into a shared parentheses. And so we have M1 times M2 to the E which is the encryption of M1 times M2. 
So yes, RSA is homomorphic and both operations, circ and triangle, are the same. Both are just multiplications, modulin. There are other homomorphic systems which have different operations there. RSA has both of those being a multiplication operation. So this can be desired and there are protocols which actually want this, but you should be aware that it's happening. And well, here is an issue that if you have a homomorphic system and you're aiming for one rayness and you're offering your attacker the ability to do CCA2 attacks, so querying an oracle for decryption, even after the challenges are posted, or even after you have seen some, well, encryption of the message. So in this game, the attacker gets the encryption of an unknown message and is supposed to break this one rayness, has the power to query um, the oracle for decryptions. Well, of course, must not query for the oracle of anything. I mean, must not query for the challenge ciphertext. Okay, so that's a big statement. Homorphic systems cannot be one-way CCA secure, or CCA2 secure. That's because of the following. Take some R, encrypt it, get the ciphertext of R, and then you combine the ciphertext CR with the ciphertext that is your challenge. Now, CR is different from 1, so C prime, which is a combination of those, will not match the challenge ciphertext. And this is an encryption of R triangle M. So this is a different from, this, from the challenge ciphertext, so you can ask for a decryption of this. Now that decryption will give you R triangle M, and then at least for, well, the operation that we care about for the RSA system, we can recover M from this. So in the RSA crypto system, for instance, you would encrypt 2, then ask for the decryption of that times the challenge ciphertext, which would be the encryption of 2 times the challenge message, and then you just divide by 2 modulo M. So the fine print says that this requires that this triangular operation is something where you can actually recover M from it. So there has to be, say, a division by two or some feature like this. But that's fairly common. So final slide, um, how can we actually get security? So I've been ranting about schoolbook RSA, showing you two examples of how you have some non-desirable property, desirable properties. Um, RSA OAP is actually a step before using RSA. So what you're doing is you take your message and you process it with some encoding. There's nothing secret happening here. It's, everything is a public operation. It's fully invertible, as you will see in the exercises. Um, but this adds a certain structure to the ciphertext that will prohibit these attacks. So one part is that it randomizes the message. So we don't have a deterministic scheme anymore. So the encryption of M0 when the attacker does it, doesn't match the encryption of M0 when the challenger does it. So the um, indistinguishability attack that you've seen doesn't apply. And the other part is, well, it in, uh, destroys any kind of nice algebraic features. So what we're doing in the OAP is we take the message, then we take a bunch of zeros, a fixed number, K1 of zeros, we append those, and then we also pick some randomness, k0 bits of randomness. Okay, all of this will have to fit into the message m. The message m will have exactly the same blocks here. So there will be an r and an s as the output. Oops, I actually mistyped. This should be s and t in this notation. Um, moved around too much. r would be really, really bad. I'll fix that before the slides go up. Um, so the encryption first computes this thing, and so the message has gotten longer by k0 plus k1 bits. So your original message, lowercase m, must be shorter. Now that's not a problem normally, because you want to use RSA in order to encrypt your symmetric key. Your symmetric key is 128 or 256 bits. With RSA, we're looking at 2048 bits and up, so there's lots of space. Okay, so this is a form of padding. And this is well. 
and OAP stands for asymmetric encryption pair. Well, that is optimal, at least so, so the author said. Now we combine those and then we take a hash function of this randomness. So G is a hash function which expands. So K0 gets expanded to L minus K1 bits. And then the result gets XORed here. And then the result of this gets run through another hash function H. This one is actually compressing. It goes down to K0 bits. So we can XOR here. And so then the message that we actually encrypt with RSA is the concatenation of R and S. So that is the integer that we use for RSA. And then, well, when the receiver decrypts this, so they get the capital M, and then they have to undo this diagram, which you will see how it works, in order to get the message back. In this unraveling, they will also check that there are actually K1 bits of zeros. And okay, well, the R here has implicitly been proven to be correct. Okay, so this is a safe way of using RSA. So don't use schoolbook RSA. There are some other ways of how RSA is being used, for instance, in PQCS version 2. Um, there's also version 1.5, which seems to be hard to die and is not nearly as good.